Hey everybody, welcome back to this series where I go through various RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be doing something pretty different. Uh, I'm going to be going through three adventures that are all intended for low levels of various editions of D&D. So I have one for advanced D&D second edition, I have one for third edition, and then I have one for fourth edition. Um, and I, I just really think, so I, I don't know a lot of these old adventures. Uh, I played through, I've played through one of these three. I started to play through another one. Um, but I think it's fascinating to look at these and to see how the design philosophy changed between them. Now, the, the, second, uh, the first and the second ones that I'm going to go through are only a year apart in terms of their release. But uh, this is the very end, this first one, the Return to the Keep on the Borderlands for second edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, was released in 1999, right at the very end of the second edition lifespan. Um, and third edition was released in 2000, and the adventure The Sunless Citadel, which is the second one I'm going to be covering, is was one of the first adventures released for third edition, if not the first. Um, and it was, um, again, that same year, 2000, so this is a year apart, but we'll see that they're very different in their design philosophies. Um, so let's just go through it. Now, I didn't play, I haven't played much of Advanced D&D. &D. Um, I have the Rule Cyclopedia, which I think came out in 91. I have, which... Um, you know, it's sort of a com com compilation combination of a lot of the older books and things like that. Um, this is a reimagining, of course, of the Keep on the Borderlands. It's like a it's like a sequel to it. It's supposed to take place like 20 years after, and so the map is generally the same as the Caves of Chaos from uh, from the original, you know, uh, Keep on the Borderlands adventure. Now, um, this dungeon is very much. Uh, sorry, this adventure, this book, is very much in the style of older games. And I think that's what makes it so different, because once you get to 3rd edition, a year later, the philosophy seems to be completely different. This is still old school in its sensibilities. Now, there's a lot of stuff that's going on here that is much more modern in its aesthetic and its sensibilities. There's a higher emphasis on role-playing, there's a higher emphasis on player safety and on balance, um, a higher emphasis on fairness, as opposed to sort of rulings, or sorry, yeah, it's with rules over rulings a little bit. Um, that, you know, if you make a certain ruling, you have to be consistent with it and has to apply equally to players and monsters, which is an interesting idea. Seems much more fifth edition, fourth edition, certainly, than old school games, where, you know, often monsters will have abilities the players can't have, and certain rules will apply to the monsters that don't apply to the players. Um, so anyway, here's what you get on the front cover. Um, and uh, and the uh, actual table of contents. Now this PDF is about 68 pages. When it came out, this was basically thirteen dollars, twelve ninety five, or something like that in 1999, which today is like twenty four bucks. So um, you can get it for pretty cheap on Drive Through RPG. But I think that's crazy. When this came out, this was you know about thirteen dollars. And you're going to see it's not just an adventure; it's a region. Very similar to the Keep on the Borderlands, but it has more to it, I think, than that original adventure had. Now, the first six pages of this document, it's only 68 pages, but the first six pages of this document are advice about how to run games. So it's obviously intended for low-level parties, new players, and new DMs. Um, rules about how to deal with darkness, how to deal with heroes dying, how to divide treasure, the ecology of the dungeon, exploring the dungeon, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, the idea that you know you have to be fair. It says, if the PCs can do it, so can the NPCs and the monsters. Extending the same benefits and penalties to all sides impartially makes the game more fair and hence more interesting. That's a sort of thing I don't really see happening a lot in old school games. Now, obviously, there are certain rules that do apply to everybody. That's the basic. It's a game. <laughs> you have to have rules that apply to everybody. But the example that they give is that if PCs should die at negative 10 hit points instead of at zero, so should monsters. That doesn't necessarily seem true to me. Um, or if PCs can run away without suffering a free attack, then monsters should do that too. And again, I don't think that those sorts of rules necessarily need to be even for both sides. Obviously, you, you have to be fair, you know, fudging dice is not something I, I, I particularly approve of. Um, but when it comes to these sorts of rules and the rules that apply, the idea that it should apply to everybody equally, that's a more modern sensibility, I feel, than an old one, where there are maybe separate rules that apply to, to monsters and, and players. At least this idea that uh, it should be fair, that sounds much more like um, like uh, RPGs as sport, as opposed to RPGs as war, which is, or, you know, uh, battles as war, adventures as war, which is something that I think uh, Ben Milton over Questing Beast has talked about in one of his videos, and it's, it's something online, right? Sport versus war, and the sort of fairness of those two things. Um, interact with NPCs, this is a very heavy uh, role-playing 
adventure in a lot of ways. And then, uh, you know, running away, secret doors, weather, and a final note about if you're first time dungeon master, make sure you're comfortable with this and read through the rules and, and know all that stuff. And you get the keep itself, which is much more uh, developed than the original keep on the Borderlands, where I don't think the NPCs had names. But here, everything is given a name. You have, uh, you know, the, the name of the keep, Kendall Keep itself. It's used in, it says, if you're using the World of Greyhawk setting, here's where it is. Uh, and then you get the map of the keep. And then the different people in the town. And you get, like, the details of who they are and where they are. Um, you know, you, you get the sense of, like, there's a certain number of guards, and there's Sabine, and she lives in the gatehouse with her two twin boys. And it's, like, like they're, they're, you know, really detailed in terms of who's where uh, in this town. Um, because it assumes you're going to have some adventures in town and some things are going to be happening there. So it's a much more filled-out region. And in that sense, I guess, it's um, pretty standard in a lot of... Uh, a lot of um, Adventures have this sort of you know, built-out town that you can that you can go to and, and see. Certainly, much more so than the old old games, uh, or at least this this one where things weren't named. In particular, it's a lot of details about the town, uh, including I think a lot of extraneous detail, paragraphs of text that you got to read. I mean, it's, again, this is old school in one sense that you do have to read a lot of information <laughs> in order to get it all in. Because a lot of those old modules are like that, right? Where you just read through it and read through it and read through it. There's just a ton of text for each thing. Then there's uh, advice for some adventures in town. Or you get, you get uh, sorry, the potential henchmen and allies, and they're all named. And uh, the following eight non-player characters are provided to help round out player character parties who might need an extra fighter or someone with a special skill, like healing or lockpicking or spellcasting, to have a decent chance of success. So you get a bunch of named NPCs that you can join, that can join your party. And they have their appearance, their skills, and a quote from them that gives you a sense of what they're like. <laughs> I think that's funny. Adventures in town. And you get the, uh, the the slaver, the assassins, Sir Robin, and then that's basically a three basic adventures in town. But then you get the area map, and it's a very, of course very similar to the old Keep on the Borderlands, but it's modified and things have been added here. And the wilderness has sort of adventures that are not detailed, but they are at least referenced and, and laid out in little a little bit. So you get random encounter tables, of course, and then the bandits who work out here. But then you get the bee man, the bullet, caravan, or the bullet. I think it's bullet. I was a bullet. Uh, the bullets, some people say. Caravan, giant frogs, gnolls, a harpy, leeches, lucrota, lizard men, pilgrims, shambling mount sturges, spiders, and the shy tower, which is a location that sort of has a, uh, a uh, well, a uh, thing, a secret about it. It's, it's a big mimic, basically. <laughs> the shy tower is a giant mimic. And then you got will-o'-wisps, wolf spiders, and zombies. Uh, Okay, and then you get the Caves of Chaos themselves. And it's pretty similar. Obviously, you start with kobolds because you always start with kobolds in these low-level D&D adventures. Um, and if you're familiar with the Caves of Chaos, obviously, you'll kind of get a sense of what this dungeon's like. Uh, a lot of text, right? I mean, you're just reading through text and text. This is a module you do just have to, like, study. Um, there's not a lot of help given to you in terms of ease of running it, but that's just not uh, really... Um, what a lot of these old games were given. Now, I think we're going to see, by the time we shift over to 3rd edition, the next one, there is much more attention laid uh, into giving you quick information and into organizing things a little bit better so that you can really quickly, uh, more quickly, I should say, get a sense of where you're going. And that's going to be even more developed when we get to 4th edition. So there is a movement towards ease of use, which is good. Right? That's just a positive thing. Um, I think very often there's sort of a nostalgia that looks back on the old editions and OSR, right? It's just kind of perfect in their old form, but you know, that's not what, that's not what the OSR is. The OSR isn't just a copy paste of these old editions. It's kind of a, a, an adaptation with, with some developments and advancements. And one of those I think very often is ease of use. Um, so yeah, we get the, the, the details of the different bandit groups. There's this NPC who she's, a bandit who pretends to be a captured prisoner if you if you burst in on her. Um, but for some reason, she kind of stays with you. And the, the, the note that they give you is like, it's up to you whether you think she'll actually become an NPC with the party or if she'll turn on them. I have no idea why she would ever not turn on them at the first opportunity. She's a bandit. She's with everybody here. Um, she's only doing this because she thinks you're about to come in and kill her right then. So it's kind of a funny NPC encounter. Maybe there's more to it that I missed or something, but I don't know. Um, get the former orc lair. So again, it's like a take on the old Caves of Chaos. So if you've played the original, then there are a lot of callbacks and, and things harkening back to it. Um, but it's, uh, 
it's obviously not the case anymore. Um, and so things are different. The orcs are all dead, for example, and they've been killed. And there's some other changes that have occurred through here. There's the Goblin King. He's still running here. The Goblin Refuge is a troll cave. There's the former Hobgoblin Lair, but it's been taken over by strange zombies and skeletons of wizards that have risen from the dead and now are doing their own thing. There are skeleton maids in there. Um, there's a lot of interesting treasure here. I kind of like it. And then you get a bunch of abandoned rooms in the Hobgoblin Caves. Um, and then you get Fungus Cave, which is, has some Sturges and a gelatinous cube, and a were rat and some giant rats. The Bugbears, Bugbear Shaman, and some Slaves. Um, there's a Priest of Nurgle down there. Then there's the Labyrinth, which is sort of a twisting tunnel with a, of course, um, Minotaur, who wants to destroy you. There's a Medusa. And then there's the former Knoll Lair, which is now an owlbear cave. Um, so some skeletons and zombies there. And this is where you get some of the uh, the necromancers and the uh, the um, you know the cult that's actually operating out of here now. There's the hidden temple, um, the pious dead. There's an adept's chamber. Um, again, a bunch of stuff going on. There's this weird room where there's a game of chess going on where two people are playing strip chess. Very strange in the middle of this cave dungeon. There's some evil NPCs to fight. One is very honorable, one is very dishonorable. And then there is the final fight with the Priest of Nurgle and the High Priestess of Erishkigal. Erish Erish and then you have an after the adventure note with the final map on the end and then the back uh, back page. So um, really, really interesting to see that the design of this book, you know, it's it's old It's old in, in, in one way. It looks very much like those old editions. This is the silver anniversary of the return of the Keep on the Borderlands, right, the idea. Um, very much in the vein of the of the older style of adventure where you get these big blocks of text, you get lots of rooms, um, some NPCs to interact with a lot of magic items, uh, but it's shifting more, I think, into much more easy encounters. There's no, as not really that many ridiculous death traps in here. There's not really anything that would be considered unfair. There isn't really even all that many places where the players have to be all that clever. Um, it's it's much more reliant on their abilities. It's much more reliant on their skills. Um, there's a lot of role playing going on, so it's more modern, I think, in its sensibilities. Um, but let's look at the next one, which is the Sunless Citadel. Now, this is one that I have a lot of nostalgia for because this is where I really started. I started playing D&D with uh, Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition. And I, I, before that, I played Middle Earth role-playing. But this was the first D&D kind of game that I played. And we had the box beginner set, which had tokens and maps and a bunch of set adventures. And that's sort of what I played for a while. And then we got this, the Sunless Citadel. And I, I think I've played through this adventure once or I played through much of it or most of it. And as a player, and then I've run this now, I think twice, once in third edition and once in fifth edition with the re, uh, re-release of it in the, uh, the uh, Tales from the Yawning Portal. So the Sunless Citadel uh, by Bruce Cordell, really actually great adventure, I think, in a lot of ways. But again, probably a lot of that's my nostalgia, but I actually think it's, it's, it's pretty good. So remember, this is intended for brand new characters, brand new players in a way, because this is really, really early release from the from Wizards of the Coast, which now um, was, was releasing <laughs> the D&D products here. Um, and, and so even though it's intended for new DMs, um, it doesn't have a whole, whole, whole lot of like, here's how to play. It sort of assumes you're going to have read the player's handbook, the DM's guide, and the monster manual by this point. References those a lot. But it doesn't kind of give you a, like, here's advice for how to run this adventure so much. You kind of just jump right in. You have the preparation that you should do, and it's just that. And you get the adventure background with the adventure synopsis, which I think is pretty cool. It gives you a sense of, like, how this adventure could go. And then you have character hooks, rumors with Oakhurst in that small uh, box on the side. And then you get the time of year, uh, very brief rules for darkness, mapping, and marching order. And then you get the Sunless Citadel itself. So very different in its preparation. I know it's not a region 
the same way that uh, Return of the Keep on the Borderlands is. And the town itself is not given all that much detail. You get very brief names and notes. Um, I think it's actually pretty good. Now, there's not a whole lot going on here. If you want to make the town much more interesting, you do have to develop it a bit. But it doesn't seem like it's that hard to do so. Because, especially in the character hooks and in the rumors that you hear, there would be some role-playing going on and some things happening and it wouldn't be too hard to put it all together and develop it. And I am always a fan of adventures where things are hinted at and left for you to develop than things where it's all laid out and here are, here's what's going on, here's everyone's name, here's their relationship, which is much more return to the Keep on the Borderlands um, from before. And actually we're going to see that it's a little bit like that in the next 4th edition adventure too. So the Sunless Citadel itself, I love this art, but again, it's it's uh, it's not for everyone's taste. It's definitely third edition. It's that kind of blocky cartoon or comic book style of art, uh, very um, kind of over the top and jagged, and and uh, yeah, again, not everybody likes it. I think it's good, but it, it definitely, when I look at it, I just get you know the sense of me as a kid. <laughs> I just I just go right back to that. Um, the Sunless Citadel itself is a pretty cool uh, adventure. There's an overview for the DM, like of the history of the place, and it's just that side text. Now, here's what I meant by by a little bit more emphasis on ease of reading, ease of use. So instead of having these large block paragraphs, you still have large block paragraphs, but you give you are given a bit more division. You have creatures at the end, which are noted number and hit points. You get uh, particular details of, of creatures and tactics and of traps, um, and then if there's something interesting there, it's sort of an italicized the beginning of the start of the paragraph. Um, so you get a little bit more in terms of ease of quickly using this adventure. Now there still aren't, it's still not you know bullet points, it's still not bolding and uh, italics of magic. It's, it's not terribly consistent. Um, you still have to read paragraphs of text in order to figure out what's going on here. But it's a little bit easier. And there's also in this one, there is read aloud text box text you're supposed to read aloud anything in that box is supposed to be read aloud and very often that's not my that's not my preference um because you know it just assumes i mean it can be helpful especially if you're kind of going through it and you're not very used to it but it's just not it's not my preference um you get a kind of cool side trek here now one of the things is you don't have a map of this until the back of the book um, it's also on the front cover, of, uh, underneath the front cover, I believe, but at least at the back cover, you get the maps of this place. Um, and there wasn't like a, a second map document that came with it, so you really just had to flip as you're going through this dungeon or draw it out yourself, which I think probably most people did. I know that's how I did it. I drew it out myself. Um, so I had to do more work there. The basic idea of this dungeon is pretty cool. You've got this um, old forgotten uh, dragon cult temple, basically. Uh, and below it, there's this uh, cursed grove with this evil cursed tree down there that's creating fruit. And the goblins and the kobolds up in the keep itself are fighting over it and kind of fighting over territory. And the goblins are being used by the, the, the evil druid down below. It's, it's pretty cool. There's a dragon here, which is good. Uh, very few uh, Dungeons & Dragons adventures have a dragon. This one does, uh, which is cool. It's a little dragon. It's a little ice dragon, I think, white dragon. But it's cool. It's a little silly dragon in your Dungeons and Dragons game. Uh, there's a few side paths with some creepy things going on. One of the sort of side stories down here is that there is an adventuring party that has gone before you, and they're all missing. And so you're kind of trying to find where they are, and various ones are dead in various places, or dead or worse. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of interesting treasure down here. There's some some hints at future possible adventures. But for the most part, it's just a pretty standard introduction to basic D&D ideas. But there is faction play going on here, goblins and kobolds, and you can interact with both. One is more trustworthy, but the other is sort of more powerful. And, and so you can kind of work with one or the other. If when, I, when I ran this game, uh, my players worked with the one to destroy the other and then turned on the other and destroyed them too. So pretty much wrecked everybody. Um, you get a cool goblin king. Um, but you see that it's like it just goes right down into the dungeon. Uh, it's a pretty big dungeon too. It's it's uh, you know you're looking at almost 60 rooms here um, with Belak and the Golthius tree, which is where that comes from. And then you have two of the adventurers who are now under the control of the Golthius tree. And you have what happens if the uh, if the players fail and if they succeed and how they succeed. 
Um, and then there are some possible adventures that they could find. They're probably going to be level 2, maybe level 3 if they do everything. There's an appendix for statistics at the end. Um, with a great quote from William Blake, which I think is cool. <laughs> a fool sees not the same tree that a wise man sees. That's awesome. Uh, you get all the different NPC stat blocks with the magic items that you find down here. Uh, all together in one place. Um, which I think is cool. Once again, you get an idea. And then there's a special stat block, monster stat block that you don't get elsewhere. Here's the grove level of the dungeon. Here's the dungeon itself. Finally, you get it on the very last page of the book. Is the dungeon itself. Um, there are a few loops going on here, but it's not a terribly, terribly connected dungeon. But I still like it. Again, a lot of this probably is my um, nostalgia. But it's simple, it's straightforward, you get a sense of where things are. The cutaway map help is helpful. And then the fortress map itself is, is pretty good. And below that is where you get the grove. Um, this one is pretty linear. Like you start in 43, and you just go 42, or you maybe start in 42, but you can go up to 43 and it's the Underdark, but that's not somewhere you're going to go to in this adventure. And then there's a couple extra additional rooms, but mostly you're just going through 47, 48, down through 49, then you go down through 50, 53, 54. Like, it's just, it's it's pretty linear once you get down to the Grove level. Um, and there's not a whole lot you can do once you're there. There's the bad guy, he's just, he's just waiting for you to fight him. He's literally just standing there. With his companions, like they're—I don't—they're supposed. <laughs> what are they doing? They're just standing there, waiting for you to come to them. So there's no—they never leave. They never go around. Uh, things are pretty static once you get down to this level. And that's it, Sunless Citadel, for first level characters. But you can get a sense it's a very different style of game. It's a very different introduction to D and D. Um, there's still a dungeon. You're still fighting kobolds, but it's much more linear. Um, there are factions, but it's limited factions instead of just here's a big adventuring zone with a bunch of different creatures and kind of here's some loose connections between them and here's a big bad. Uh, there's a similar design philosophy, I think, between second edition towards the very end and third, but the, the other elements of second edition keep it in a different genre almost <laughs> than third. At least that's how I see it. But the next one we're going to look at is very different. This is fourth edition. Fourth edition is a huge departure from both of these. This is the starter set, uh, Keep on the Shadowfell, which is a take on Keep on the Borderlands, or at least an homage to it or a reference to it. Now, I forgot to mention, when the Southern Citadel came out, obviously, it's it's smaller. It was only about $10 um, uh, when it first came out, which is about $17 today. This is in 2000, so it's a little bit smaller of a product. It's, it's, it's about half the size, a few dollars less uh, a year later, so it's much cheaper in a way than to return the Keep on the Borderlands. But the Keep on the Shadowfell was... Uh, very much more expensive. I mean, we're talking even in today's terms. Um, it was about $30 when it came out. And that's about $42 today. It came out in 2008. Um, but it does, this is, this is by far the longest of the book. It's about twice as big as The Return to Keep on the Borderlands. It's 145 pages. Now, a good number of that are your extra characters and how to play the game, because this is the starter set. Uh, but this is designed by Bruce Cordell and Mike Merles. Of course, Bruce Cordell worked on the Sun of the Citadel, but Mike Merles also uh, worked on this here. And you get a lot of, I think, really interesting things here. And now, fourth edition just has, you know, whatever kind of reputation it has. I'm not going to go into that right here, but um, it's a complex system, especially if you're starting off. And so you, you kind of have to kind of know what you're doing if you're coming in. Um, uh, if you're coming in fresh. And this is a starter set adventure, so it has to go through all of it for you. How to play D&D, the core mechanics, skill checks and attack rolls, encounter some much more detailed information, of course, than the return on the Keep on the Borderlands. Um, you have your actions, you have how combat works, and, of course, combat is a huge portion of this game. It's kind of a combat game. And it leaned into that, which I'm sort of okay with, right? Like, it, it, picked, a, it picked a lane. It wasn't a lane that most of its fan base, or much of its fan base, I shouldn't say most, but much of its fan base didn't like. It was a lane that a lot of people didn't like, but it picked it and ran with it. And, uh, you know, for as much uh, for as much hate as I think often 5e gets today because it's too bland and it's too generic and it's too trying to do everything and it doesn't do anything particularly well, which is, you know, a bunch of valid criticisms, I think, um, at least to some degree, 4th edition did something very well as a combat simulator. <laughs> it was It was a great high fantasy high power combat simulator with balance I and mean, this was this was this was D, D combat as sport if you're ever going to find it um 
Now, I'm, I'm going to go through this early stuff pretty quickly. It came with pre-made characters, a dwarf fighter, a halfling rogue, a human wizard, and a half-elf cleric, because I want to get to the adventure of Dragonborn Paladin. Keep on the Shadowfell. This is the adventure I kind of want to start with. It talks about the setting here, and it talks about the threat uh, that you're dealing with, um, and recent developments, Calarol, and the adventure summary. So very similar in that way to the uh, third edition adventure, and how to prepare, how, how you should prepare for the adventure. Use a hook to get the players into it, a particular one, and the quest XP for completing that quest. Again, it's very particular, much more, it uses the language of, you know, uh, online, or I should say video games. Which, had, which was one of the inspirations, of course, for 4th edition, was the success of World of Warcraft and online games like that. Uh, and so the language it uses is much more open to that. But the ideas are very similar to 3rd edition in this sense. What you need to play. Now, one of the things that this book came with was a lot of tactical maps. Uh, and that makes sense with the game, the idea. How to use monster st statistics. And I mean, <laughs> this is a level 5 monster stat block in 4th edition. Right, I mean... <laughs> He, that, that's a lot of information to run one monster. So it's just a very different game we're talking about here by 4th edition. I know this is all stuff everyone knows, I'm sure. This is not a surprise to anybody. 4th edition is a very different game than 3rd. Than third. And 3rd third and 2nd have much more similarities. But I think they're... What I like about going through these uh, adventures like this is just you see the differences. Like, you really see the difference in design philosophy between them. I think that's cool. Um, and why... Kind of maybe you can speculate on why they did what they did here. More information about how to fight. <laughs> More information about how to move in combat and occupy squares. And Yeah, this is the starter set, so you need all this stuff. Here's how you gain levels. Here's the conditions you can deal with and the skills uh, and how they work. Uh, but this is all, I think, consider this, this is all in the adventure. Right, this is in the adventure. It, this is after you've gotten past the quick start rules and you've gotten to the adventure itself, it still gives you all this information. So you have a very set kobold encounter to start. Encounter level 1 and how much XP it costs. Here is the breakdown of the creatures you fight. Here is a read aloud text. Here is what happens. And uh, read this and then you enter into the battle. Set a, a, a combat with tactics given to you. Features of the area and then what's next once the fight is over. So very straightforward. Here is where they are. Here is what they're going to do. Here is how they're going to fight. Run it for uh, your players. Very, very easy by the book. But it's very easy paint by numbers by the book. Like, as long as you know the rules, so as long as you've read the book, you don't have to do very much to run this. Because it's all right here. That's not my preference for a game. I, I much prefer to have to think on my feet and to be, a, you know, kind of more creative as a DM. This is all just, you're, you're basically a machine in the background. You're running the numbers for the, uh, for the uh, system to work. The system runs. You plug in the numbers and the system runs. And uh, you give funny voices to the monsters as they fight and die. <laughs> That's basically it. Um, one of the things you're supposed to do is prompt the players. You move things along. You ask leading questions. So are you going to do this now? And they're probably going to say yes. So you, you, <laughs> you know, you're very much moving them towards the way that they're supposed to go. So here's a town. It's, in one sense, very similar to the Keep on the Borderlands. You get a lot of information about it. Where, uh, who people are. Where they are what they're doing, what they want. Maybe less information than Keep on the Border Lands, certainly more than the Sun of the Citadel. But here are the questions that, that the PCs might ask, and here's what the people would say, and have it written out for you. And it says, you know, maybe you have to come up with your own sometimes, but here's a good uh, guide for how to, how to run this. You don't have to role play very much because you get it right here. Here's what you should say. If you talk to um, Berwin Wilderson, you met our kobolds, I see. No, no, not ours, really. But they have made it a habit to harass travelers on the Old King's Road. I mean, you just read it. And you know what this person says. You don't have to figure them out. You just read what they say. Uh, there are some places you can go. It's not completely linear. Afterwards, you can go to the uh, kobold ambush site again, where there is uh, another kobold ambush, I should say. Uh, and you can go back to the kobold lair and uh, there are features of lair inside the lair. So there's a couple extra uh, uh, encounter areas. Uh, there's a burial site um, with some stuff going on. And then add more to the story. This is some advice that it gives you halfway through. If you, you know, here are some things you can do. Apply mannerisms. Give accents or favorite sayings to NPCs. And when you paint the scene, 
add in weather, add in scents, you know. So it, this is really trying to give you a sense of how to DM, but um, it's, it's advice that really brand new players or really brand new DMs might get, but I think um, uh, it, it's so technical, right? It's like, here is how you DM well, here is how you play well, here is how you do this well. And, uh, and I think as a result, you get a very cookie cutter experience when you enter into this. Everybody who plays Keep on the Shadowfell as a first experience is going to have the same experience. Or at least a very similar one, it seems to me. Because a lot of this stuff is like, here's how it goes. Here's how you run the adventure. Here's how you play it. Here's how you. Here's where you go. Here's how you lead the players to where they need to go. Here's what the NPCs are like. Here are the connections between them. And so it's just going to be the same, very very similar every time. Um, then you have the keep itself, which is a pretty straightforward dungeon. Uh, it's 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 nice. It's not bad. Um, you got the goblin encampment, and you've got the keep itself. Um, and you can see the dungeon is pretty much, it's got wings. They don't really connect. Uh, you can go down into the section 9, 10, 11. You can go into section 2 and 4. You can go down into the section 7, 8. You can go into the section 5 and 6. They don't connect. So maybe there are, you know, loops that might link you there, but it's not a, a vast explorable dungeon that you're going to search in any order. I mean, you could go in any order. You can go left, right, or straight when you come down the stairs. And if you go left, you're going to encounter this. And if you go right, you're going to encounter that. If you go straight, you're going to encounter this. But there's no... There's not lots of loops. Um, it's pretty pretty linear in one sense. It's that tree branching structure as opposed to the looped dungeon. Goblin guards, and here's how you fight them. And the assumption is obviously you're going to fight them in a straightforward fight. Because if you don't fight them in a straightforward fight, what are you doing playing this game? So again, the idea that you would turn goblins against each other or that you would... Um, try to uh, sneak past all of these things. Uh, it's just not even in the cards. It's not, it's, not, it's not considered. You could, but what's the point of playing the game then? Most of the rules, most of your rules are about combat. Most of the advice you're given as a DM is combat. So why would you have the goblins negotiate or run away or, or you know, do anything else? They have rules for fighting. It's balanced. They're going to be an even challenge for the party. So just do it. And again, some people like that. Some people love 4th edition for that reason. And I think getting into it with that mindset, it's a fun game. If you're like, hey, I'm going to play, you know, I'm going to play a battle. I want to I do some fights. Then 4th edition is a great, even sports game. I want to play a board game. Uh, then you play 4th edition. I don't hate it. No, I'm not hating on it for those reasons. I think it's not a terribly good role-playing game. It doesn't encourage it. And in fact, it seems like the mechanics of it uh, discourage it. Um, or at least it discourages creativity. But, again, if you're playing Risk, you're not creative. <laughs> you might be creative in your strategy or your tactic, but it's, it's the, the rules are the rules. Same thing seems to be the case with this game. Um, so you get you know, different, different regions, different... It's just it's straightforward as you go down. If you, depending on what you've done here, you level up, and if you haven't reached second, you're probably close at this point. So here's how you level up and just switch, you know, flip your sheet over. Now, again, this is a first adventure. So you play this, this is how you assume D&D &D is meant to be run, right? And this is how you assume, because if you're brand new, this is the first experience you play. So you might, you might say, well, it's, it's, it's really hand-holy because it's like, well, it's a brand new game, but the Sun of the Citadel was also for first level players. It assumes brand new people to third edition. It's not really that hand-holy. Return of the Keep on the Borderlands, it's at the very end of the life cycle of advance, so it's pretty clearly not going to be super attractive to new players, but it still assumes that there might be new players and it's built for low-level parties. And so it gives you a six or so pages of it and then it's up to you to kind of do the rest. This game is very hand-holdy. Here's how you play it. And so by the end of it, you're going to assume that's how these, that's how these adventures should be run with box text and set encounters and, and this option or that option. I can use perception or insight. Which one do I choose to use? Right, that sort of idea. Um, but it's a it's a long adventure. Don't get me wrong. You go and you kind of go and you kind of go. Now, one of the things I love about this is that there are much more frequent maps, and you get uh, 
you know, a lot of attention has been played to layout because there's so much information that has to be conveyed to you. The layout is important. You get bolding, you get, uh, you know, uh, indentation, you get uh, set information placed in certain places, magic items, treasures laid out. You get much more attention paid to detail, or much more detail is paid toward, uh, yeah, the details of, <laughs> can't speak, much more attention is paid to the details of layout. But that's almost by necessity. Um, keep going, and uh, you get level two, which is the uh, level, uh, you know, not quite the, the lowest level of the dungeon. I think it's a three level dungeon. But you get uh, hobgoblins, and uh, of course, there is a uh, gelatinous cube. You get kobolds and gelatinous cubes. As you go down, it actually starts to get more interesting. Now, going back to the map here, sorry. Um, you can see that the uh, once again, it's pretty linear. You're, you start in 12, you go through, maybe you take a detour to 13 and 14, then you go down into 15, then you go to 16, 17, and you're going down. So it's just, there, it, there's, a, there's a path that you're taking. You might have this variation, you might take this side branch, you might not, but it's, it's, you're going down that main path. And so again, I think a lot of people, a lot of DMs are gonna assume that's a design dungeons down that linear straight path, building encounters and encounters and encounters until you finally get to the boss encounter. Totally makes sense if you're playing a game like this, a combat game where that movement really, really does matter. You get the Shadow Rift, the final region, where there are Deathlock Whites and Skeleton Warriors, and then you get to the end. There's Tactics, playing Calaril, and what's next if you defeat him? And then there are maps. <laughs> Now, most of the end of this book is a breakdown of the maps that you get. Let's see if I can uh, scroll down through it. Yeah, you get a whole bunch of maps that go along with it. And that's it. So a good, a good portion of this book, the last 50 pages or so, is actually just maps. Which means that if you look at the adventure itself, it ends on page, what, is that 95? No, the adventure ends on page 80. And it starts going all the way back um, to the beginning of the actual adventure, which is page 16. So it's actually pretty comparable to the keep, Return to Keep on the Borderlands. Because if you take out the maps and the how to play, then um, it's about the same size. Okay, so three very different adventures, three very different um, starter sets. They're all the same in that are they all similar, I should say, in that they all deal with kobolds first, which is the connecting tissue here. No, but they're all for low-level adventures, and they're all kind of site-based, here's a town, here is a dungeon nearby uh, kind of places, uh, with a variation on how much wilderness stuff is given. A lot is given in the Return of the Keep on the Borderlands, which fits with its more old-school aesthetic. Less is given in the Sunless Citadel, which is more to the point. Here's a town and a dungeon, and you're going to go to the dungeon, and you're going to stay there until you finish it, and it's going to be level one through two, maybe three, and you're done which is often, I think, how 3rd edition operated. It had way less downtime because of the way the resting worked. It had way less um, town interaction. Uh, and it wasn't yet video gamey in the sense of here are quests to do in a town hub, which is kind of how the Keep on the Shadow Fell goes. So 3rd edition was kind of in a, in a middle ground between those two views of D&D. One as much more open simulationist, here's a sandbox to play in, and fourth edition, which was much more, here is uh, a game and an adventure, and uh, you know, here's a here's a video game aesthetic sort of. Um, but I think all three of them do different things well. I think the Keep on the Shadowfell has much more attention to, to layout and detail, and it holds your hand, so if you really do want that combat game, Keep on the Shadowfell is the way to go, right? So in the Citadel, I have a lot of nostalgia for it, but does it do anything particularly amazingly well? I think it's a very solid adventure. And it's like you can plug it in anywhere because there's not a lot of background information given. There's not a lot of motivation given to a lot of the NPCs and villains and monsters besides very simple ones like territory or more, you know, food. And so you can plug that in anywhere. So it's a very easy, it's a very good adventure to plug in and plug and play. Whereas the, and the Return of the Keep on the Borderlands is, again, much more of a set region. And so you're going to be playing this sandbox. But it's a cool sandbox. Um, I don't think it's as cool as the original for a lot of reasons, and I don't think it's my favorite in terms of its layout or design or, or the villains and monsters you're fighting. It's pretty vanilla in a lot of those ways. But that's okay. 
a lot of these are vanilla. Um, and vanilla isn't necessarily a bad flavor. All right, well, I hope this has been interesting. Uh, it's kind of a weird video. I don't know if I'm going to do a lot of these or, or any more of these. But I just thought I had these three uh, adventures, and I thought they're all low-level adventures for different editions. It'd be kind of fun to go through them and just see how they, how things are changed, how things compare, uh, how things differ. Uh, I'm sure there are people who do much better. I mean, I know there are people who do really good analysis of the breakdown between editions and the design philosophy changes and stuff like that. But I found it interesting just to flip through it. I hope you guys did too. All right, I'll see you around.